Beautiful team, welcome to Record Breakers. Uh, our familiar face joining the stage with me today in Diff Crowd Up. Now, team, uh, we have this funny thing going on. Um, for those of you that don't know, we've discovered that the Q&A part of Zoom is a way better function <laughs> than the Zoom chat. So if you have anything to say, please put it in the Q&A part because the, the chat bit's a bit overrated. I, I heard about a guy like last yeah. week, Diff, use the chat went outside and then like got really sick all of a sudden. So <laughs> whether the two are correlated or not, I don't know, but yeah, you know, I don't want to take the risk. I'm not a crazy Correlation person. is causation. That's absolutely, <laughs> there's no doubt. Right. So team, we're still trying to figure out the chat part. I swear, I went into Zoom. I went into my personal settings in like the Zoom website. I changed it. I put everyone can chat to everyone. I did it. I did the thing that Zoom is asking, yet still we can't see the chat. I'll figure it out before next record breakers. But for now... Anything you want to say, put it into the Q&As. We do see them coming straight up. Um, you guys just won't see it from each other, but we'll read it out for each other. Oh, Josh Richardson has it. He says, in the webinar controls toolbar. Okay. 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 I think we're on something. <laughs> That's not here. helpful because you still need to find what Where's the webinar is. controls toolbar? Let's have a look. Where is it, oh, Josh? It is. I it says, towards the bottom of the in-webinar chat window. Can we just stop? Oh, actually, I reckon, I reckon I know what he's talking about. Here we go. So we'll bring up the chat. Sorry. Sorry, Josh. Great content. Or I could be pulling your leg, Josh says. <laughs> All right, let's just dig in. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So team, uh, joined by Diff uh, this week. As I said, for the next sort of three weeks, we've got some special guests coming on. Next week, Diff, I'm shafting you. We have Sean Foster jumping on, who is the king of lumpy mail. Absolute yeah. gun at using the strategy. We're going to do a whole episode purely on how to use Lumpy Mail to land meetings with some of the biggest uh, uh, biggest deals in your accounts. Some of those whale deals that I know so many of you are looking to close right now. He is an absolute gun at landing meetings with those deals. He has committed so much of his sales prowess uh, to doing that um, and using that strategy in order to grow that part of his business and that grow that part of his pipeline. So that's for next week. Absolutely pumped. This week, of course, we have Dick Crowder. Team, uh, please put in the chat last, uh, sorry, in the, um, actually in the Q&A. Yeah, yeah, the better uh, one. Around about, yeah, the better one. Two, about two weeks ago, Diff, was it the episode we did together? Um, uh, and, yeah, it was two weeks ago, yeah. Yeah, and Diff, the feedback that I had personally from that was that a lot of people appreciated the level of depth of thinking that you have and the level of thought that you can apply to even just the most simple of sentences or questions <laughs> or whatever it may be. It's really valuable That's stuff because we don't question this stuff enough as salespeople. I think a lot of us can be just gung-ho, you know, gunslingers. And yep. we don't sort of stop to think about what it is we're doing to the level of depth that you have. But I believe, different. I'd love to hear your thoughts, if we do take the time to really think about it and self-analyze why we're doing something the way we're doing it or how we're going about it, then that's actually the only place from which change can happen. If we're not self-aware of how we're currently do, doing something, how could you ever change it? Is my personal perspective yeah yeah i mean i would say i agree to a point uh what i would say and you know this is what i always do i agree to a point and then i just yeah. clarify but change is going to happen regardless the real question is whether or not it's the change that you want change that you're involved in change that you thought about if you're not doing that process of thinking then you will change but it will be external things changing you rather than internally kind of self-chosen change so it's i always say that to people like you're going to grow <clears throat> growth is is just what happens over time Yep. It just is about in what direction are you going to grow? Love it. Okay. And so today's episode, Diff, we're going to, we're going to hone in. I will be playing devil's advocate a bit. I want to yeah, challenge good. you because I'm, we've yeah. had these conversations on the Bigger Game podcast a lot, and I don't know that a ton of people have actually had the ability to hear you speak on the topic. For those of you that don't know, Diff isn't actually, doesn't have a background in sales. And that's what makes so much of this conversation valuable is that he comes at it from a perspective that many of us won't have thought of before. And that's other than that, we're just sort of salespeople talking to salespeople and that's great. We love it. We've done it for years, but why not bring in the different perspective? So, how about you, Diff? You can introduce me. I'm not going to introduce myself. <laughs> well, as you all know, this is Darcy. And uh, this is a really, this is, you know, he writes these for himself, which I, I think needs to be pointed out. Like no one writes these on behalf of Darcy. Darcy writes these about and himself. It's, it's the, one of my favorite parts of the week is coming up with the tidbits to introduce each episode. <laughs> Particularly for yourself, right? Because Darcy J. Smythe <laughs> is forever coming up with great new podcast ideas and following through on exactly zero of them. And I know for a fact 
that this is incredibly true. And it shows a lot of uh, self-knowledge that Darcy would even be able to write this about himself. But man, I reckon there wouldn't be at least a month over the last two and a half years that Darcy hasn't come up with an idea for a podcast. And uh, I'm always like, yeah, yeah, good one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know I can just park that. I don't even, I, there's, I don't have to reserve even the slightest part of my brain for that yeah. because Darcy will forget it. He'll forget it within the hour potentially, yes. uh, or at least if he doesn't forget it immediately, there's no way he's going to follow through on them, which I really appreciate because it would ultimately mean more work for me. So I'm oh, glad right. that he doesn't follow through too much. My latest idea, which I actually think diff, you and I could um, partner on if you'd be interested. I've heard yes. that one about seven times. <laughs> and please put in the chat. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, I've got to stop saying that. <laughs> put in the Q&A. Don't put in the chat. The chat stinks. Uh, right. Put it in the Q&A if you think it's a really good idea. I think there's not enough podcast content diff on the intersection between business and sport. Like people are in sport. Yep. And that there's a business that runs the entire thing. Like there's marketing teams, there's sales teams, there's promotion, yep. there's marketing, like whatever. There's also a ton of sports people who leave sport because they need to retire at the age of 36 because, you know, their bodies are broken. And many of them actually get into sales and business. Um, mm. Just be way that they go. I think there is an intersection of very interesting and intriguing content about the world of sport and the businesses that sit behind them to actually make them real. I yeah. think I might be onto something. I think I've just kicked a light bulb in your mind and I reckon you might be joining me. I reckon that's good. Yeah, I tell you what, Darcy, as soon as you start that podcast, I'll join you. Fantastic. Diff. <laughs> uh, Diff, I must say, Diff, you do strike us, the entire Record Breaker community, as the type of bloke who would have got really into poker when it was big, when we were like 15 years old. Remember poker just swept the globe? Joe Hashem was like the most famous Australian there was because Stuart, Stuart Appleby or Robert Allenby hadn't won any golf for ages. So now we're just over to Joe Hashem. Like might've been that stage where Shane Warne took all the drugs. So he, you know, was removed from the game for a year. Real low light in Australian yeah. sporting history. <laughs> Joe Hashem just took over. I reckon you would have been a Joe Hashem fan. Am I right? Oh uh, yeah. I was, I, I got into poker. I watched it for a while. I had access to, you know, I was just thinking the other day before the internet proper, and I mean fast internet. So before KO, if you wanted to watch American sport or poker or something, you had to have cable. Yeah. This was an amazing thing, right? Like if I want to talk, I'm a big NFL fan. Uh, you're, we're both big NBA fans. Yes. Not very long ago in human history to, to watch the amount of, of American football, American sport that I watch now, I just would have needed a cable uh, yes. account. You know, I just yeah. think that's nuts. Anyway, I watched poker uh, because I had access to cable for a while. Watched yeah. it a lot. Loved it. I loved it. Yeah, had access to cable. Yeah, yeah. I was living somewhere and they had cable. And I'm like, hell yeah, man. I'm just going to watch poker all the time. Poker and baseball. I love it. Team, round one. Uh, we, well, I do have the music if you want me to play it. I can. I'm happy to do so. I mean, it's, it's there. No one's taking the music away from the webinar. It's never going away. It's just sometimes we play it more often than not. I sometimes just think when Steve's out. here, we can play it. And when there he's not, that's fine. Dr. Diff's question time, if over you, mate, we're, we're going to dive deep on this. Tell us, where does purpose come from <clears throat> and how essential is it to a successful sales career? And I'll, I'll frame this for you, Diff. Um, yes, we sure. have conversations with companies all the time, sales teams all the time, where we say to them, one of the first things we'll ask is, so what are we doing this for? Because, you know, wanting to grow your company to, to 50 million by the year 2025 or wanting to increase your revenue by 28% year on year for the next three years, like, that sounds hard. That's that's hard work. That's going to require change. That's going to be uncomfortable. Why do the uncomfortable thing? What's the bigger purpose behind this? What's the bigger vision? Other than just growth for growth's sake, though maybe that is a purpose, I'm unsure. I'd love to hear from you in, in this context. But I'd love to throw it over to you from a man that has you know studied philosophy more than anyone I know. And I, I think at the core of philosophy is this idea of purpose. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Where does purpose come from and how essential is it to a sales successful sales career or for any career? That yeah. I mean, that's a complex question. And where does purpose come from in itself is a, is a debated question. There's no kind of one answer to that. In fact, the history of philosophy has been the history of people have coming up with different solutions or different ideas for this particular question. <clears throat> we probably live today. Generally speaking, people, absorb the culture from around them and the culture that we absorb is a culture that's been formed usually around 100 years ago by thinkers and that and then that that thought will kind of trickle down slowly get its way into education and culture <clears throat> and then all of a sudden we find ourselves living 
in a cultural milieu that's being created by the way that some people thought 100 150 years ago or more of course because those people were impacted by you know centuries before them and 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 so on throughout time what we're probably living in the most at the moment when it comes to this purpose question is existentialism which is that there is no external purpose there is no concrete objective purpose <clears throat> there is the purpose that you make for yourself and that's probably what you hear the most. It'd be what you hear the most on uh, motivational podcasts on sort of, I know she doesn't have a show anymore, but Oprah, Oprah Winfrey kind of style things um, on LinkedIn. If there's any kind of pseudo philosophical pep talk on LinkedIn, it's usually coming from this kind of existentialist framework. So guys like Jean-Paul Sartre and, and Albert Camus and stuff had this kind of way of thinking about it. But if you go all the way back to Aristotle, Aristotle would say that, uh, purpose is one of the four most kind of fundamental ways of knowing what something is. He used a word called telos. And telos is bigger than just purpose. Telos is kind of something's created end. It's the, it's the reason for that thing to exist. Yes. And it's all, almost like <clears throat> unavoidable. It's what it's designed to do. And that means that if you don't follow it, then you're kind of going against your own internal design. And that's why I want to kind of answer the second half of your question there by taking out the successful sales career. Because let's put it this way. I want to answer purpose... your question by not answering it at all. <laughs> well, no, I will, but I'll just answer it more broadly, right? Because uh, purpose is essential for being human. And obviously a human is the person who is a, sex, a successful salesperson. And so if you want to try to have a successful sales career and you want to reject all questions of purpose, well, then you just, you won't be able to be a successful sales uh, person. Uh, these two things are inherent in each other. So we actually, there's, there was a Harvard study um, by a guy called Arthur Brooks <clears throat> a number of years ago, and he, and, and he was looking at the question of happiness. And he said, ultimately, looking at all these longitudinal studies of happiness that had happened over, over decades, put them all together. Let's see if we can find like the most funda fundamental thing. Apparently, about 50% of your happiness is pure genetics. It's just people some people are more genetically predisposed to be happy than others which i think you would sense. find really interesting yeah that's really interesting you do since i was playing golf uh on the weekend with a guy and i said because i've got a five-month-old daughter i said and he's got an 80-month-old daughter and i said mate at what age did you start seeing the personality traits that she has today you're 18 month old at what age did you start seeing those traits and he goes, mate, now looking back on it they were there from day one almost like yep. you know and yep. there was nothing that we could do he said as a parent, you're always like, oh, was I, did I just say something that's going to shape their personality for the rest of their life? Or did I, you know, not bring them up in a way that whatever? He's like, at the end of the day, a lot of times their personality is just going to shine through regardless. And you do see this, mate. Like you see kids who are just being kids. And mm -hmm. no matter what you do, they're just going to be smiling ear to ear. And then other to, kids, a point. No matter, to a point, then other kids, you can see like, well, I suppose to your point is to 50%, isn't it? 50%. Yeah. So, so 50 percent of it is is based upon genetics, <clears throat> but the other 50 percent is within your control. And though, and it comes down to four things. Those four things are family, and that means having a close group of people. Sometimes that's not biological family, but if it's not biological family, then it kind of needs to get to the point where you feel about those people as if it's biological family. Yeah. <clears throat> Number one. Number two. Friends. And it doesn't mean having a lot of friends. It means having a small amount of very close friends, people that are known by you and that you know well and that hurt when you hurt. It's, it's friendship at a very deep level, which unfortunately very few people have these days. Uh, in the UK, there is a minister for loneliness because of the loneliness epidemic that's, that's going through the world right now. <clears throat> You know, and that's based upon this. I could get into all sorts of hours of conversation about that. The third, the third one is uh, some kind of philosophical or theological, some sort of faith thing, way of dealing with the pain and suffering in your life. Like if that's just pointless and, and nihilistic, then that's very difficult to find any meaning in. And the last one is feeling like you have a purpose in your work, feeling like when you go to work, people need you to be there. Yes, meaningful yes. employment doesn't just mean getting paid to do your work, but actually being appreciated and feeling appreciated and feeling needed 
to be there at your work. And so I would say that that, that purpose question kind of comes into there. There needs to be a sense of purpose. And if you buy the existentialist idea that you create your own purpose, if you analyze that too much, you can see that that's just like a spiral down into nothingness because it's like, well, this is just me creating it and I can change it. And so there's no objective standard, you know, by which to measure it. Uh, so yeah, purpose is, is massively important. And look, I'm just scraping the surface on it right there, but teleologically speaking, so that's the telos idea that we all, everything has a purpose. And so you can't fight against the idea of purpose. The question is, are you living according to your purpose? Mate, love it. I'm going to, I, we could talk on that for hours and know, hours and hours. I know you just scraped the surface there. I'll, I'll chime in here with how the psychology side of things, that's this philosophy, the psychology. And Diff and I often have this conversation. Um, if you've listened to the bigger game, you'll have heard it 20 times, I'm sure. The idea of, well, here's the philosophy. And here is the brain slash the mind experiencing that philosophy. So which one is creating the other? Um in a way, you almost somewhat can't get out of your own mind. You, you can't, well, that's debatable as well. But in terms of the mind that is discussing the philosophy, is it only seeing what it wants to see or is designed to see or is the philosophy true from a large, like capital T truth perspective? But that's a whole other conversation. All I want to let you know now is this. In terms of your work, the brain loves to be able to pin itself to some sort of purpose. Okay, mm -hmm. so when you're setting goals, this is why goals work. Um, please put in the Q and A, not the chat. I would love to know. I know it's tougher to sort of put down. Um, please let us know. Uh, have you ever had that experience where you haven't set a goal for a while? You maybe you used to set goals, or you're just like you you know been in and out, but you haven't actually set a goal for a while, and you found yourself feeling like life becomes quite mundane, or you're just sort of going around in circles. Although you're getting older. Although you're growing somewhat, you think you still majority of the time are like, oh, I'm kind of just yeah, moving through. Um, mm -hmm. Josh Hornbuckle said, The Untethered Soul is a great book from Getting Outside Your Mind. Josh, that book changed my life more than nearly any other I've ever read. I'll stop that sentence there. The Untethered Soul is an incredible book. Thanks for suggesting it. Uh, Jasper, does it have to do with uh, if you have grown up around people who have drive and passion, which will form you into someone who wants to strive in life? Actually, that can be the case, Jasper. It can actually also be the opposite. There's a classic story of um, two twins. Um, they showed up to an event and the speaker said, and the twins were, one was a super successful businessman, um, multi, multi-millionaire, successful marriage, uh, kids, all had it all. His twin brother was a drug addict um, and uh, homeless and had screwed up absolutely everything in his life. <clears throat> and the, uh, the speaker said to him, um, you know, why are you the way they are, why, the way that you are? And both of them said, because my father was the way he was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, essentially saying, you know, they both saw the same father who was a, you know, a drug addict, homeless, et cetera. And one said, well, I definitely don't want to be that way. So they went the other way. The other person said, well, all I'm going to become is exactly like him. So both of them said, because of my father. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. But anyway, as far as that goes, whenever you have this experience of feeling like you're just, you're, you're, you're there, but you're not necessarily moving forward, you can get quite um, emotionally uh, caught up everything can become very um, you can take things very personally you can be very sensitive etc largely because when you set a goal what it does for you more than anything else please write this down if you take any note from today's uh, psychology piece please write this down setting a goal gives you emotional regulation setting a goal gives you emotional regulation because ultimately what your emotions are always trying to do is balance you they're always trying to put you back on that track of where intuitively you think you need to be okay so if you're feeling super sad that's completely normal because it's some sort of emotion is processing in order to get you back to some sort of equilibrium or balance emotions are always there emotions are always your friend they really are they're, they're, they're a natural part of life don't try and change your emotions or cut them out they're a natural part of being a human being okay but if you don't actually have a goal that you're aiming towards then your then your mind doesn't necessarily know the track to get you back onto and so what will happen with your motivation is that it'll dip and wane based on like a roller coaster because you'll be like, well, I woke up feeling good today. I should probably do some good work today. Or I woke up feeling a bit crap today. I don't know if I'm going to do crap work today. I don't know if I can be really bothered. And that's all you can ever go on because your goal, like, like Diff just said, you've always got purpose, whether you like it or not. It just turns out that your, your purpose then has actually just been to feel your emotions. 
Mm. And that's as far as the purpose has gone. If we peg our purpose further up the road and go, actually, the motivation of the drive towards this is to actually expand our company and be in three com- uh, be in three countries worldwide um, and grow a team of 20 and we pay for all of their houses. That would be the dream. I'll, I'll know I've made it. That's the North Star I'm going for. Well, when emotion comes up, then it's actually just designed to keep you on track back towards whatever is required to actually go after that goal. And if that's the goal that genuinely truly lights you up, then your emotions will serve you. If it's a goal you've made up, two ticks if, if it's a goal you've made up largely because you think on some level that's the goal you're meant to have because someone told you that's the case, that's when it can start to get a bit tricky as well. But that could be a conversation for another time. If, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'd only just throw into that. Like if you've got a if you've got this goal, like the, the example that you used us of, you know, growing into three countries and 20 people and buying their houses and stuff every goal is subservient to another goal there's kind of this infinite regress of goals and purposes you know i talked about that a couple weeks ago with aristotle um and so you have to kind of connect into the deepest element of it uh if you have this goal which is just this kind of growth for growth's sake then that's not going to be sustainable long term because at some point the pain is going to come and you're going to say well what are we really doing this for you need to have an answer that's deeper than just for example growth for growth's sake when you put that personal element into it i want to buy houses for all these people i think that's kind of the that's the linchpin when it's about these kind of core things that i talked about before that's about relationships with other people it's not just about building something for its own sake because the thing in itself needs to be good in order for you to really believe in it. Yeah, if you're building something that you well. don't really care about, then it, it, that's just, that's not a, that's not a purpose that's going to be able to speak to the kind of the deep part of, of who you are. Yeah, well said. We spoke about this last week, the whole idea of if you don't think it's good for others, it's got to be tough to grow it. It's got to be tough to sell it. Exactly. It slots in nicely there. Diff, <clears throat> the essence of time. Um, one thing that people don't know about you, Diff, is, or well, some people don't know, is that a lot of your background is in education and teaching. And all of these conversations we have about philosophy, psychology, we trust they bring the light bulbs for people. This is good stuff. Um, but you've seen this actually play out in the world of education over the last, how long have you been in education? 15? Yeah, about 15 years, yeah. Yeah. So we live in a very interesting world, Diff, where the, the landscape of education is changing and the way through which we teach ourselves why we teach ourselves, the outcomes we're looking to achieve through teaching ourselves and the modes through which that teaching is happening are completely shifting. Many people are starting to, say, criticise, I would say, what you would call like teaching first principles. People like, you hear people say like, well, I don't need to know that. Um, Chat GPT knows it for me now. Things like this, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So the landscape of education is changing. With that, I want to to dig deep here because education is one of the core tenets of success for salespeople. If you can't educate yourself or if you're not driven to grow and improve and learn, you're in the wrong industry, period. And I'll never know, you'll never hear any sales trainer apologize for saying so. So ongoing learning is essential as a modern sales pro. Where is education changing the most? And how do we know quality education when we see it? I know those are two very different questions. So kick up on the first. I want to answer the second one. Go ahead. Yeah, I want to answer the second one first because... You can't know quality education when you see it. This is a bit of a catch-22 if you're not well-educated. You know, so if you think about the educational growth process as a, from a child all the way up, you're constantly levelling up in what it is that you're engaging with and understanding. A kid learns to talk, learns to understand words, then learns the alphabet, then learns how to read. And then the reading that they do becomes more complex. And at, I think everyone at some point in time taps out and says, oh, that's, that's complex enough for me. And often, unfortunately, it's when we finish our formal education process. Mm. It's like, oh, you know, I got to grade 12 and I had to read some pretty complex stuff there and that's enough for me. And in fact, probably what we end up doing is we revert back a couple of years because unless we really liked it. Yeah. So the question is, uh, how do you know quality education when you see it? If you, or what are you measuring it against? Uh, what are your standards to be able to ascertain that? So 
I would say one of the most important things in education is that every time that you do some level of self-education and honestly, just reading and reading good books is the best self-education that you can do because it's the easiest and it's the most accessible. The problem with that is that we often choose things which are not very challenging. We choose things, and I think this is particularly in the, in the business self-help kind of world, these books are written lowest common denominator. Mm. They're actually written to be easily accessible. Uh, and why? Well, because they want everyone to be able to get the truth out of it. But if you believe that actually there are increasing levels of complexity with truth and the more complex stuff is actually the stuff that's more valuable because it's speaking to the complexity of life. Well, you need to be able to grapple with that complexity. And so you need to be able to read that kind of material. So if you're always reading books that are exactly the same level of difficulty, if you don't have to really switch your brain on, if you don't have to write notes and get an extra cup of coffee, then you are basically saying, this is the level I'm going to stay at and I'm not going to go up any more other than that. So I would just always say, what you're re- first of all, you should be reading. Secondly, what you're reading should be somewhat challenging. So if you pick up a book, Dip, and it doesn't make you uncomfortable, you won't you won't read it. Well, I'm sure you not read it for growth's sake, for the purpose of growth. Oh no, that's not necessarily true, right? Because I mean, <laughs> if I want to read a business self help book, I just need to take what's there, and they're not necessarily all that complex. But I read other things which is pushing my thinking in certain directions. Yes. And then when I read good to great, which I'm just reading again at the moment, because it really is just, I mean, you, you can't beat it in many ways. It's fantastic. Um, it means that I'm thinking through some of the things that Colin says in good to great at a level different or more complex than he's intending it, but I'm able to think about it in less of a simplistic way. That makes sense. So the, 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 the more you upskill your own ability to read, and educate yourself that way you can go back to the simpler books and you'll actually read them in a whole different way yeah i think so and and you'll be able to see past the stuff like the thing that always annoys me about those books and patrick lencioni writes great leadership books but he's a real culprit of this is they pad the thing out with so many stories and i'm like i get it i get this one principle that you've written 100 pages about and you just needed to sell a book or whatever. So you've padded it out with all these stories but if you could just give me the basics now i understand why they do that because People might need stories to be able to understand it and get it drilled into them or whatever. But I'm just saying that we should be in the way that education is changing. I think uh, individuals need to be more accountable for their own education and they need to realize that it's meant to be hard. If everything that you do is easy, you are not growing. Nice. Well said. Love it. Uh, Diff, you want to give us a bit of a rundown on um, where we're at with the Arcade Effect book? Speaking of that, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I sent uh, we sent the arcade book, uh, arcade effect book off to the publishers finally uh, after uh, plenty of revisions and stuff yesterday. So that thing will be going to the printing press imminently. Awesome. Uh, a ton of you commented on Steve's post uh, on LinkedIn there around about it would have been about a month ago now, or even a little bit less, and said, "Yep, count me in for the free uh, copy when it comes." Um, Team, if you want a free copy of that book, we're paying for postage, we're, we're taking care of everything, um, email julia at ybravo.com. Julia, J-U-L-I-A, at ybravo.com. Um, and just say, hey, Julia, would would love a copy of The Arcade Effect when it comes out. Just flick her an email. She'll put you on the list. We'll make sure you're there. Um, and when the book is officially printed, we'll have one on the way to you. Mate, an absolute pleasure, Diff. Thank you for, for joining us. Uh, last Thank thing, team, is we are doing the, the giveaway of the MacBook Pro. We're coming down to the final uh, final run of that. So you'll hear us promote that at the end of the next couple of webinars. If you haven't got your entries in yet, we'd love to hear a testimonial on how you use the platform to, to grow and what you're loving about it. Uh, one entry for a written, 25 for a video. Um, we'll include the links and all of that coming out a bit more sooner once the final days are coming to actually uh, to get your entries in. Diff, an absolute pleasure as always, mate. You're a gun when it comes to this stuff. Um, and I know it's always such an insightful conversation for our audience. So massively appreciate it, mate. Funny. Thank you. Always lots of fun. Ripper, Sean Foster next week on Lumpy Mail. Yeah, Pubs, looking forward to it. Cheers, Diff. Have a great weekend, everyone. Yeah, See you next week. Cheers.